Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to welcome everyone today. I appreciate everyone coming out in this weather. Um, my name is Judge Terry Dees. I am the judge currently assigned to the dependency bench here in Manatee County. Um, a lot of you are wondering what brings us here today, and I can answer that question. So according to recent data published by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, Florida has seen a tremendous surge in overdose deaths involving opioids. The Florida Supreme Court recognized that our state court system is involved in the judicial administration of many cases involving individuals with opioid use disorder, particularly in problem solving and family courts. As a result, the Chief Justice of the state of Florida, Justice Kennedy, issued a proclamation. He declared July 2019 as a month of awareness in the state court system regarding opioids and the treatment of opioid use disorder. Thanks to the incredibly hard work of the one and only Alfred James, our talented and dedicated director of Manatee County Treatment Courts, we have been able to assemble a diverse and knowledgeable group of individuals today. They are going to share their knowledge and their experience regarding this crisis, which continues to affect our community, our families, and our children. With the assistance of our panel members, we hope to further understand the effects opioid use disorder has on individuals appearing in courtrooms in our circuit and apply that knowledge to the cases coming before us. In short, the Chief Justice told us judges, we need to learn. So that's what brings us here today and I'm gonna turn it over to Alfred. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Before we begin, I'd like to uh, just begin with uh, introduction of our panelists, give a little background. Uh, we have <clears throat> Samantha Cobe, who's uh, the director of addiction, of the Addiction Center, Centerstone, Florida. Uh, Centerstone, of course, is a local nonprofit behavioral health organization. And Samantha is a graduate of, of uh, Florida State University with a master's and bachelor's, I mean, bachelor's and master's in social work. And she has uh, over 11 years of experience uh, in the mental health and addictions treatment field. We also have uh, Philip P.J. Brooks, who is the Vice President of Outpatient and Youth Services at First Step. He's more than 17 years of counseling experience. He's a licensed mental health counselor. Uh, he's got a master's degree in uh, rehabilitation counseling from the University of South Florida. And P.J. has over 30 years of experience. Uh, the emphasis on 30 years there, P.J. <laughs> We have uh, Dr. Jennifer uh, Bensey. She is a MD, MSA, and she's uh, the health officer for the Florida Department of Health in Manatee County. And uh, this agency is involved in uh, many population health initiatives, including work site wellness, school health, and environmental uh, monitoring. She has over 22 years with the department and is also a board member of the Manatee Memorial Hospital Center Stone and Manatee Healthcare Alliance. We also have Joshua Barnett. Joshua is uh, Manatee County Gov government's first healthcare services manager. And Josh does a lot in this county to make a lot of things happen here. Uh, he has a total of 15 years of cumulative experience with uh, public health, uh, with the administration of substance uh, use and behavioral health services. He's got a BS in psychology from Florida State, an MA in uh, thanatology from Hood College, MAS from Johns Hopkins, Bloomberg School of Public Health, PhD in behavioral and community services from the University of South Florida, the mental health, uh, Department of Mental Health and Law. We also have Marjorie Mann, Marjorie, near and dear. Marjorie uh, is a graduate of our own drug court program here in uh, Manatee County. And uh, she's a certified peer recovery uh, specialist, and she herself is also in recovery. And she is the founder of uh, Creation Ministries of America, 
an organization that strives to assist people in overcoming substance use and abuse issues. And she constantly educates herself in order that she be, may be more affected to advocate for those with substance use disorders. And uh, Marjorie also comes alongside those who lost loved one having lost her own son who was murdered in uh, July 2013. Uh, Patricia? Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and she's currently the director of the First Step Sarasota Peer to Peer Program in Manatee County. And uh, she, she has been a child and adult advocate for approximately 30 years. And in the past 10 years, she's become a certified recovery, recovery peer specialist and a certified senior advisor. She attended Lawrence University in Wisconsin as well as the Harvard Extension Program in Cambridge. And uh, she's worked as a peer assistant liaison uh, at the Mental Health Community Center in Sarasota and a peer health navigator at Magellan Health. Uh, we also have uh, Michael Osborne. He's the clinical supervisor for Operation PAR, Parental Awareness and Responsibility. Uh, he's the Medication Assisted Patient Services uh, Director and has over 10 years experience. He's a certified master's level addiction prof professional, as well as a certified e-therapist. And he received his master's degree in counseling psychology from Troy uh, University and conducts various trainings uh, through PAR. And then we have Jamie Morrison. She's a licensed clinical social worker with the Manatee County Community Paramedicine Program. Uh, this program works with those who would be better served outside of the emergency room setting. And Jamie assists in connecting patients with substance use treatment resources and supports individuals seeking recovery. She has an MSW from Salem University. And she previously worked at Mount Auburn Hospital at Harvard Medical Teaching School as an emergency room social worker and substance treatment and referral social worker. And finally, but not least, we have Captain Todd Shear. Todd has over 24 years of experience with the Manatee County Sheriff's Office and having 11 years in the Child Protection Investigations Division. And he's currently the commander of the Special Inve Investigations Division overseeing enforcement of unlawful sale, possession, and trafficking of controlled and illegal substances. Captain Shear received a BS in marketing from the University of South Florida, MS in criminal justice from St. Leo, and he's a 2018 graduate from the FBI National Academy. I know I've taken a little time, but I just wanted us to understand why we have assembled the people we've assembled so that we can talk about the issue of the opioid use uh, disorder. We're gonna begin I have a PowerPoint presentation. If you notice, it says opiates, how we got here, where are we, and where are we headed? The, the purpose of, that I had was to talk about how we first got to where we are. Because a part of what we're to do with this, 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 this panel and this discussion, we're also to provide education uh, for people who work both in the circuit but also uh, the community as well. And I want to begin by just giving a little overview of opiates and how we got to where we are and how they operate and a little bit of an effect upon the brain. And then we're going to shift and I'm going to move to the panelists and begin to ask them some questions about some of the things that we may find in this PowerPoint. So today, of course, our topic is about uh, opiates or opioid use disorder. Quite often, we see these terms. They are different, but they are interchangeable. We'll talk a little bit about that later, but opioids are simply a cl class of drugs that are either derived from or chemically similar to compounds found in opium poppies. And they interact with the uh, opioid receptors on the nerve cells and in the brain. There are three main classes of opioids. You have natural alkaloids, such as codeine, morphine. These are what we, these are what we would call opiates. They are the naturally occurring uh, alkaloids. Then you have semi-synthetics, which include heroin, oxycodone, oxymorphone, hydrocodone, and then you have synthetics, buprenorphine, methadone, fentanyl, and there are others that uh, are also there. So when we talk about it, it's important to understand what we're talking about when we talk about 
opiates and opioids. And all classes of opioids share the trait of binding to the opiate receptors of the central nervous system. System is basically like uh, having a, a key that fits into a particular lock. If you don't have the right key, it won't open the lock. And that's what those, the, that's what the, the, the opiates do. They bind to receptors uh, in our brain and in the nervous system, and they begin to uh, activate certain effects within. All opiates are used to treat pain. Some are used to treat pain and cough, such as codeine. Um, here's, the, here's where the rubber meets the road, and this is where we are today. One of the issues with opioids and opiates is that they all build tolerance very quickly and lead to physical de dependence. Uh, this, this causes users to, to take larger and larger doses in order to feel the same relief. Um, start out at a little bit, but the more you use it, the more you're going to have to use to get the same effect. And then it'll probably get to a point where you're just using so you don't go into withdrawal uh, because of the tolerance. And, and that is what leads to the, the addiction and the overdoses because uh, the person requires more and more of the substance in order to get the same effect. And so it leads to both the addiction and the overdose. And all opiates affect the brain in a particular manner. And as we previously stated, they all generally uh, are for pain. And pain is part of the reason we are uh, where we are, but I'll wait a later to talk about that. But, but, but the problem with the opioids and with, in reality, any substance that people get high on is that the amount of dopamine that is released in the brain when a person uh, ingests these, these substances. Uh, dopamine is, a, is one of those things that causes people to feel good and that's what leads to the euphoria, the high that many people experience. And part of the issue is that the brain is, is wired there to repeat pleasurable activities. And our reward system wants to co continue doing those things again and again. Uh, I was reading a, a Harvard article, and it talked about how substances cause the brain to go from liking to wanting, which is a pretty good analogy. Start out, mm, I kind of like that. But then the more you do it, it becomes not just something you like, but something you want. And then it moves into something that you got to have. And uh, part of what we talk about, we talk about opioid use disorder. Uh, part of that whole process is that people get to a point uh, where using takes up much of their time, mentally and physically. They could be sitting at work, and they're not concerned about work. They're thinking about how they can get their next hit, uh, or how they're going to work about getting whatever plan and action in order to get it. And that's part of the uh, disorder component, because it begins to uh, take up a lot of our thought processes. Um, opioids and other drugs stimulate the limbic system of the brain, and that's, that's where we talk about the reward system there. And, uh, what happens is this system is, is responsible for many of our emotional responses. And as th that system experiences uh, the dopamine flood, uh, it actually begins to desire more and more. And it's what we call the reward system. Uh, and, it also, and it remembers, it memorizes pleasurable events such as food, sex, drugs and other things. Uh, that's why you can have some people with all these different kinds of, the, of addictions because uh, some of our brains are just wired a certain way and when we engage in certain activities, uh, we're reminded, hey, I want to do that again because that was good. And then it gets to a point to where we no longer even care about the consequences and we're willing to do almost anything to, to get to where we're trying to go. I have a uh, graphic of the brain there. And if you notice, there's the limbic system and there's the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is where we have uh, a lot of our uh, information and 
you know, thought process and, and understanding certain things. And then you combine that with the limbic system and uh, it's risk taking, emotions, reward, pleasure seeking. And, and you combine those two together because when the dopamine begins to flood, it also floods the front of the, the, pre, uh, the prefrontal cortex. And so something that normally would be in control of things now has lesser control. And, and the limbic uh, system kind of takes over. And uh, that's, that shows the, uh, the place where the dopamine goes, the blue, uh, is where the receptive regions, uh, the yellow is what pushes it out. And then those yellow lines are the projections. And you notice you have the amygdala down there, the hippocampus. Uh, those are things that we kind of learned in school. And the amygdala is an emotional component that we have there. And then we have the hypothalamus there, which regulates the body. Uh, you ever notice sometimes when people use a lot of drugs, they start sweating and they start doing all these other things? That's because the hippocampus is now, hypothalamus, I mean, is now no longer regulating the body anymore like it used to do. And so when we talk about opioid use disorder, we're not just talking about people who don't have the ability to say no. We're talking about physiological responses to substances in our bodies. And, and, and we wonder why people do some of the things they do. They do, it's not just because they are weak, it's because you've got a physical, physiological response to these things going on. And so part of, I want to talk about this as well because part of what we need, I think, going forward, if we're gonna really deal with it, we're gonna have to learn how to deal with more than just um, certain things. We're gonna have to learn how to uh, interact with, with, the, with, with, with areas of the brain and how to teach people how to do some things because uh, it's more than just saying no. It's also understanding that uh, there are parts of our body that take over or are affected when these drugs are, are, are there. How do we get here? I want to give us a little background on, uh, on opiates. Humans and opiates have a, a long and capricious relationship. Why do I say that? I say that because Opioids, when used properly, are a very effective drug. The problem with opioids is several things. Number one, they make people feel good when they take them, a lot of people. And so people want more than what they need. Uh, but number two, there's that whole physical addiction, that physical dependence component. And it doesn't take very long before you, you get addicted to opioids if you use them regularly. Three days, if you use them every day three days, you have a, not a major addiction, but you got a small addiction. You, you, you're down the road. If you don't use them, you're going to have some diarrhea, some stomach ailment. But if you stop at three days, you can move forward. But if you continue for just two more days, it's exponential. And, and the results are going to be totally different. And that's what happens with people. They, they're parting with these things, and they're just doing it, and they don't realize. And then the next thing you know, they run out of money, and guess what? They need it. Cultivation of the opiate pop, poppy goes back as, as far as the Sumerians of Mesopotamia, spread throughout the ancient Near East and beyond. And it was known back then as the joy plant. Okay, So it has a history of uh, making people feel good. And, um, Homer spoke of his healing powers in the Odyssey. I'm just trying to show us how, how long and how broad we've had this relationship with opiates. It's, not, it's nothing new, okay? And this isn't the first time in this country we've had an opioid issue. Uh, we'll talk about that later. But we've had one back in the 1800s and early 1900s as well. Uh, there were two, two wars, two actual wars between countries were fought over opium between China and Great Britain. That tells you the power of this substance. And it was in 1800s, that's very key, that morphine was derived from opium because prior to that time, people primarily utilized the opium uh, through, they cut it open and it would seep and, and they'd use whatever came out. But what happened with that was the isolation of the, of the morphine uh, alkaloid and that opened the door to other painkillers. And it was that, uh, done by Friedrich Sertuner 
1804, 1805, he wrote a paper in 1805, but I think in 1804 he actually uh, isolated it. What happened here was he isolated the morphine and he tested it with rats and stray dogs. And he noticed the responses that happened with these animals. But later on, he got a toothache. And what he did then, he actually used himself as a guinea pig. And he, he took some of it and he, and he said, man, you know, this stuff is good with, with, with uh, getting rid of pain. And then what he did was he took some more and he found out when he took more, it caused him to get sleepy. And then he took some more and he found that it actually caused him to uh, kind of lose uh, uh, his balance and everything else of his mental capacities. So he actually tested himself and some other young people to figure out and he came up with a, a range that 15 uh, grams was a dose that would be suitable, but he had started out with 30 himself. Here's something a lot of people may not know, but Bayer Pharmaceutical marketed heroin in the 1800s and the early 1900s as a non-addictive alternative to morphine. And this is the history of prescription meds as well, uh, opioids as well, because the pharmaceutical companies, when they began to make them, they promised to, to be less addictive alternatives than their predecessors, and every time they made one, it actually became more addictive than the predecessor. So opiates have a, a history. And in the 1990s, pharmaceutical companies, they assured us uh, that patients would not become addicted. That's uh, NIH 2019. And our healthcare providers begin prescribing them in greater rates. We know about that, don't we? <clears throat> but here's another issue as to how we got here, the perfect storm. Pharmaceutical companies uh, reassuring us that it wouldn't be what it was. In 2001, the Joint Commission recommended that healthcare providers begin to ask patients about their pain. And this led to pain being the fifth vital sign. And once pain became the fifth vital sign, the prescription began to churn and churn. They continue to churn because you got to treat the pain. You got to treat the pain. And that's what they were giving people to treat the pain. That was a major shift because up to that time, the medical field uh, didn't look at that. They looked at body temperature. They looked at heart, pulse, respiratory, and blood pressure. But now you got pain. And you know what happens? Uh, most of us who work in our, in our treatment courts and treatment centers realize that people who are in, in, a, in recovery or seeking recovery or in addiction, they know how to kind of get what they want when they go somewhere. Um, 2010, Pharmacy Times reported that the Tampa Bay Area had become the new destination for people outside of Florida seeking prescription meds. Uh, some of us remember people standing around uh, pain clinics just in, in mass. Uh, that same article reported that 1,185 oxycodone deaths uh, in Florida in 2009. What I don't have in there is that that same year, there were uh, 1,100 benzodiazepine deaths in Florida that same year. So when we talk about this issue, we also need to realize that Quite often when people use opioids, they're using them in conjunction with other drugs, which causes a lot of these overdose, overdose that we see. That was a 26% jump from 2008 and a 249% increase from 2005. And those numbers, those numbers are simply oxycodone. No other prescription medication. That's one drug. One drug. Interstate 75 was known at that time as the Oxy Express. People from Tennessee, Kentucky, I don't want to be derogatory or pejorative, but they would call them pillbillies because they would jump in their, they did, they, they had a TV show. They had a TV show that, 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 that traveled with these people and they'd jump in the car and they'd come from 
Tennessee, they come from Kentucky, and they ride down, they come right here to the Tampa Bay area, and they get their pills, and they head back up the road, if they were able to get up the road. <laughs> At this time, we know pill mills were doing uh, big business. And people came to understand that they just needed to emphasize the severity of their pain. And they could get all the pills that they needed. And so when we combined all of those deaths in 2009, uh, the number was 2,488 people, an average of seven people per day. Now, that was a high number, but in 2017, there were 3,245 overdose deaths uh, from opioids. Uh, and that was now beginning to be run or driven by fentanyl. Today, I want to shift the conversation a little bit. And I want to move to the panel. I know you guys are waiting. You said, boy, when is this guy going to stop talking so we can <laughs> share some stuff with the people? <laughs> but uh, I just want to emphasize the fallout because an attempt to uh, treat a person's pain actually uh, resulted in many other, many other consequences. And I say many others because it's not just the deaths, but uh, communicable diseases such as hepatitis and HIV. Uh, began to rise. And uh, if, if you watch the news with any regularity, you see all these restaurants that are shutting down and all of these other things, and, and, and hepatitis A has become a, a very, um, it, it's, it's become very rampant uh, in Florida, in the state of Florida. And I imagine HIV is probably going to rise, but we'll, we'll, we'll get some experts to talk about that a little bit later. And so there's other issues, dependency issues, uh, children living with grandparents, other relatives. And, and I want to say this, these aren't the kids who've been actually maybe put into a foster care. These are people who just decided, you know, we're going to, we need to take these kids. Uh, and then there's the foster care system, with some states seeing a rise of 30% in the foster care system. And, um, and it's also affected the... The, the criminal justice system, the legal system, because it's reported that people who use, uh, abuse opioids were 20 to 30, 20 to 40 times more likely to be engaged or involved with the criminal justice system because for many of them, they're, they're trying to get their fix. And all, at the same time, a new type of drug dealer developed during this time. Uh, part of the whole Oxy Express People would come down, get those pills, buy them for cheap, take them back up, and they'd sell them. But you have people right now who, who, get, who still get opioids from their doctors who don't use them that regularly, but you know what they're doing? They're selling them because there's a market out there, and they're making money. It's a whole new type of drug dealer out there. And so, so there's a lot of fallout. And then... Uh, there's also this thing that we don't talk about too much, but the life expectancy in America has fallen three years in a row. And it's not primarily because of opioids, but it is connected. Suicides and opioids are, are a great part of the life expectancy. Our Surgeon General uh, made a comment that he, say, he says, you know, he has a talk with his kids and he said, we'll probably be the first generation that may not outlive their children. Or at least his children be the first generation that won't outlive them. So it continues to go down. So now, that being said, I want to shift to what are we doing here in the 12th Judicial Circuit uh, to combat this? And I want to begin the conversation um, by talking with Mr. Barnett. Mr. Barnett, you're you're, you're Manatee County's Health Services Director, and I know that you're very involved with a lot of the initiatives that occur in this county. Could you tell us a little bit about the peer mentoring program and why we chose peer mentoring? Sure, an excellent overview. This was very, very detailed and very helpful, so um, I think everybody can benefit from the knowledge that you shared. So thank you for doing that, Alfred. Uh, so I work with Manatee County government and uh, about two weeks into my relocation to Manatee County, I was asked to help the commissioners identify something that they could do 
to help address the opioid use disorder affecting their community. And in working with administration, we identified that although the county and the state funds services, um, there was something that was needed to engage people who weren't going to those services. How could we capitalize on the lived experience of folks who had recovered from previous addiction and learn from them and use that unique skill set to engage folks who may not realize that they are experiencing an opioid use condition or had overdosed but had not yet connected fully to the idea of recovery or formal treatment. So the um, county commission submitted a legislative budget request that was sponsored locally and um, what that allowed was a one-time year pilot project, um, $500,000, which is not a tremendous amount of money, to hire a, a people who had lived experience of recovery, train them, and go out into the community where people were using or were overdosing or may be leaving an ER or may not be fully connected to a formal treatment provider or more importantly, when they left the formal treatment provider, mm -hmm. how to carry out those skills in their environment where they had been using or where they were at risk. That's an important chasm that tends to exist, not only nationally, but certainly here in Manatee County. And so the program um, was successfully funded, not only for Manatee, but also for Palm Beach, who had the highest number in total. We had the highest per capita at the time of overdose. And so we're very pleased to have First Step, who submitted a, um, it was a, um, a, a proposal, an RFP, a competitive bid process, and we had four applicants at the time. And this agency was able to not only move the process to hire much, ex much more expeditiously than the state, the state average to f clear the process, the background check, is around nine months. So this is an applicant who has to then go through the process of a background clearance because we want to hire them from their unique experience because they had gone through the system. And as your slide points out, they likely had gone through the criminal justice system. We need that perspective. As a clinician, we don't tend to have those experiences. So how do we engage people in a, in a more holistic, person-centered manner? It is those who have this experience. So um, we are very fortunate to have the support of DCF who helped move those folks through in about three months' time, which was much faster. They've been trained in motivational interviewing, which is an evidence-based right. practice. They've been trained on wellness recovery action planning, another evidence-based practice, which is pseudo-crisis diversion uh, for people who may engage acute services that are funded, and also just being someone who can convey the hope and um, and, the, and their lived experience to inspire others is also a modality that is moving toward evidence. So uh, we are very pleased to have it and we continue to work with the state to make sure this program continues. Okay, I'm gonna move to uh, our peer specialist. I'm gonna begin with Marjorie. So Marjorie, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself but also uh, how you think the peer program is, is, is working here in Manatee County. Okay, well, um like you said, my name is Marjorie. I am a certified peer recovery specialist with First Step of Sarasota. I've been with First Step for a little over a year now. And uh, prior to that, I have founded a ministry called New Creation Ministries where I would go out into the community and volunteer with different organizations just to help support people in getting over their hurdles um, in recovery. Um, because when I came through and was given hope and encouragement, support. So many people reached out and helped me. My heart just wanted to do the same thing for others. So that's what I have done ever since I graduated from drug court in 2002. And um, that's just been my heart and my mission and my goal. So this being able to partner and connect with First Step has just been a blessing to me. And as far as the peer, uh, re the recovery peer support here in Manatee County and what we do with First Step, we reach out to those who are struggling, who are going through a process of overcoming addiction, who are dealing with um, Department of Children and Families where their children are concerned, who may have lost their kids. And I do have a unique perspective in that I have experienced all of this. You know, I've been, I was a frequent flyer in the Manatee County jail, you know, I know Charlie Wells, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I stayed in his hotel many a night. Uh, <laughs> so um, from that perspective, I'm able to, you know, connect with them, empathize, um, help them and encourage them. Also, um, 
to um, encourage those who have lost loved ones because we've experienced so many deaths, you know. My son was murdered, you know, being out there in the streets, dealing with drug addiction. He was not an addict, but he was living the lifestyle of, a, of an addict. So I'm able to connect with them on that level, as well as, um, you know, the, the um, child care issues, the various issues that they come across, connecting them with resources, um, just giving them a hug when they need a hug, giving them a listening ear when they need a listening ear, you know, going to appointments with them, whatever they need, whatever it is that I can do to help them get beyond the pain and the struggle of, of wanting to use that drug but knowing they can't. I work closely with the drug court program, which I'm so fortunate to do. Um, I provide the um, peer mentor services here and um, what an amazing blessing. Um, so I get to work with those people who are, you know, having struggles, all of the other struggles in addition to having to complete the requirements for drug court. And that is, that's a monumental task. And so it, it just gives me great pleasure to be able to do that. And I see so many when we have groups every Friday who are just overjoyed with the um, things that we do, the information I provide within the groups. You know, I have one, you know, one lady who came to me this past um, Monday when I was here at Drug Court and she said that, you know, the group that we had on Friday, we did some role playing and, um, you know, just did a whole lot of different things. She said that that helped her through the weekend because she had encountered the exact role play issue that we did and it kept her from using. So to me, that is amazing. You know, that's amazing. So I'm just grateful to Joshua, to my director here, Patty, and First Step, and just everyone who is in support of the peer program because it is a phenomenal, phenomenal way to reach out and encourage others and help to provide the support that so many need. Okay. Patty, you want to add anything to that? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm the director of the program. I work with an incredible team of people who are in recovery and have shown that they can help lead the way for other people. We provide a lot of needs and there are certain things we don't do, but two of the things we do very well is addiction is the only disease that I know of where you can get kicked out of treatment for exhibiting symptoms. And we don't leave people when they're exhibiting symptoms. So if they're not making it, because we all know, well maybe we don't all know, that relapse is part of recovery. We don't say to them, sorry, you relapsed, we're not interested anymore. We stay with you through the whole process. You don't even have to say that you want to be in recovery, excuse me, to be in our program. But the other thing we do is we can be the conduit for somebody to segue from the jail with re uh, referrals, from the hospital with referrals, to get them to that next appointment. So they don't leave after ODing in the hospital, they don't walk out of the hospital and take a detour and go get high they can call us, and we were embedded in the hospital for a very long time where we would talk to the people when they came in, we were there every day of the week, um, and we now have a full-time staffer there. Um, so because we have the shared life experience, and I do as well, I'm 22, 23 years actually into recovery, because we have that shared life experience, we get what it's like to manipulate. We get what it's like to not be able to focus on anything like what you were saying about where's my next high gonna come from. We know how to work the system. We also know the challenges, and many of the people that we work with are mental health um, consumers as well, as I am myself. So we also understand that part. As certified recovery peer specialists, we get a lot of training in how to work with people, help them advocate for themselves. So we're not caseworkers. Yes, we have resources, but we're not caseworkers. Caseworkers more often do for you. We want our people to do for themselves. We feel that we use a goal process system also, and we feel that the process is the goal, because as you're going through your recovery, you're gonna hit challenges. We may not be sitting next to you anymore, two years down the road. If you don't learn methods to handle those challenges, you don't lose t learn tools, you don't learn um, recovery methods, you're gonna fall right back into it. So I think the, the focus is that we treat the people like they're competent adults, we don't treat them like they're exhibiting a moral failing of any kind. We identify with them specifically and in general. Sometimes, you know, I haven't been in the recovery pod, but I've been in locked psych units, and there's a lot of similarities there. So sometimes the way some of these things make us feel 
is how it makes them feel, and we can share from there. But mostly, we're filling a void. Manatee County has stepped up to the plate, but this was a void, and we're filling it, and we definitely hope that this is going to continue. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I'd like to shift now to law enforcement, because we often hear the phrase, we can't arrest ourselves out of this situation. Uh, I just heard it a couple of days ago, uh, somebody up in Pasco County. Uh, could you tell us what, what kind of initiative that law enforcement has, has put in place to combat this, both from the side of helping the person who's struggling, as well as some uh, initiative to get fentanyl and other drugs off the street? Sure. Is this on? Can everybody hear me? All right. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is the recovery pod. The sheriff kicked us off when he took uh, office back in 2017. And I think the numbers just speak for themselves. Um, there's been approximately 1,600 people that have come through the program already. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a, a fantastic program and where people who come in there have the opportunity to get counseling, services, and, uh, and, and during that process, their mind becomes more clear um, as they get time and space away from having an addiction. And the numbers speak for themselves. 1,600 people coming through, and you only have 60 people that have reoffended or come back in the system. And that's just a fantastic number, something that uh, the sheriff and all of us at the sheriff's office are very proud of. I can tell you personally, every time I go to a, a graduation, we got one coming up next week on August 1st, I got to tell you, it's one of the most electrifying things that I ever get to get the privilege to attend because watching folks graduate from that program knowing that they're not the same person they were when they first came into the jail. They're not just sitting around the jail staring at, a, at, at the walls. They're coming in there and they're leaving a changed person. And to me, seeing that change uh, is just so motivating. It makes, makes me feel really good to be a part of the sheriff's team. And uh, it's just a fantastic thing. That is the number one thing that I give credit to, to where we've seen a really lot of uh, significant decline in overdoses and deaths. So that's the number one thing I think is the most impactful. There are a lot of other programs that the sheriff has kicked off. One that comes to mind is Operation Lifesaver. Um, sheriff kicked us off about two years ago as well. And uh, we're, before we didn't have any of these programs that were out there that are now coming uh, to light, um, the sheriff just said, we've had enough of this. We're going to go out there and reach out to these folks that want help, even though they don't know mm -hmm. where these resources are at, we're going to help them find out where these resources are at. So over the course of the last two years, we've reached out to over 200 people that have suffered from an overdose. Um, it started out if you had uh, three or more overdoses, we were going to pay you a visit. And uh, a lot of these folks were surprised. They're like, well, what are the police officers coming out here for? What are deputy sheriffs coming out here for? You know, they would initially maybe run or be a little suspicious of us, but uh, mm -hmm. we've had some fantastic stories. I could talk about them all day long in, in regards to people who we've actually given rides to, uh, to Centerstone, to uh, Prodigal Daughters, Loving Hands Ministries, all these other organizations that are within our community that are doing a fantastic job getting folks the help they need in terms of just getting free from this drug, getting free from this uh, terrible bondage. And um, we've seen a lot of fruit from that. So it started out with, if you've uh, had three or more overdoses, we'd pay you a visit. Um, we've been on top of this to now. The numbers are so good. If, even if you've experienced one overdose, we're going to pay you a visit. We're going to give you resources. Uh, we're not going to arrest you. If you happen to have drugs, you want to turn them in, and we've done that. We'll take them. We'll put them in property evidence, and we'll give you a ride to a treatment facility or get you in touch with somebody right then and right there. Um, the sheriff has made this uh, throughout the whole department. Awesome. You can call 911. We have a program called the Intervention uh, Assistance Program. Call 911. A deputy will come out, they'll take the drugs, put them in proper evidence, and we'll give you a ride to the treatment facility 24-7. So, you know, it starts at the top with our sheriff, and, and uh, we've been carrying that out for well over two years since he's been in office. All right. Thank you. Jamie, uh, I'm going to go to you now, okay? You're a first responder, EMS. Uh, could you talk to us about how things have changed with EMS since the advent of the opioid crisis? And I want to know if there's any, any training that's changed to become an EMS as a result of this crisis? So first of all, I want to say that I've only been in Florida 
since March. So a lot <laughs> of what I'm going, you know, it's just based on the data that has been presented to me. Mm -hmm. And the specific program that I work for is called Community Paramedicine. So I do work for EMS and there are times that I will be on the scene as a first responder, but I'm a licensed clinical social worker. And so a lot of times I come after the response. Mm -hmm. um, there will be times that I am able to be on the scene and help divert um, a hospitalization or that sort of thing, or maybe, you know, help connect them to treatment or to the peers. But my role often comes after, you okay. know, after the overdose, helping connect them to treatment. But based on um, the data and whatnot that I've been given, you know, obviously, for me, I've Work, my career has been in substance use. I'm from Massachusetts, which is an entirely different system, but this is exciting coming to a new system that's, you know, just different. Medicare. And, um, you know, Manatee County was attractive to me because of the initiatives for the opioid epidemic and what has gone on here. And from what I've understand, at the peak, um, EMS was responding to about six to seven overdose calls a day. So overdose calls don't necessarily mean that it is opioid, but it's just identified as an overdose. Um, between 2013 and 2019, there have been a total of 4,635 calls for primary or secondary impression of overdose by EMS. So that has been that many 911 calls that at least appear to be related to overdose. Mm -hmm. Some of them can be, you know, an elderly person who had an adverse reaction to their medication, but a lot of those obviously are opioid related. Um, unfortunately, between 2013 and 2016, there was a total of nine individuals who were found deceased by the time EMS got to the scene. Um, between 2017 and currently, there's been a total of 10 individuals who were deceased by the time EMS came. Um, 4,425 individuals have gone to the hospital, were transported by ambulance for an impression of overdose. Um, in this far this year, it has been 578. Um, the good thing is with Narcan administration, mm -hmm. um, a lot of these numbers have gone down. Um, between September of 2018 and September, or currently in 2019, there has been an increase of Narcan administration comparatively to the year before each month. However, that's a positive thing because they come to the scene and they're able to provide this medical resource that didn't exist prior, and this is life-saving. Um, not always when Narcan is administered is it for an overdose. It can be for a suspected overdose sometimes. You know, you mentioned benzos. Um, they can There can be symptoms that look quite similar. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, there's been um, definitely another good thing is um, in 2016, the total cost of Narcan for EMS was over $100,000. In 2018, it was about $30,000. So that's a big difference. Um, and yeah. so that means that there's less, I right. mean, mm -hmm. it hopefully, I mean, and granted, <laughs> I did say that had, has increased, but hopefully that means that there is like the decrease in the need for Narcan administration. Um, but Narcan has been a huge thing educating the first responders on how to, what resources exist, how to interact with people who are using, um, and then programs like the one that I work for where I'm able to connect with people. Maybe they leave the hospital, they didn't connect with peers, they weren't interested at the time, but they get referred to us and our paramedics are able to kind of see how they're doing medically mm -hmm. and if there's a medical necessity for more help and I'm able to maybe form a relationship and convince them to work with other resources, whether it be Centerstone or the peers that can help them get into recovery. And I can also even provide them with resources like 12 step, you know, it's pretty open what I can provide them with, but hopefully guide them to a course of recovery. Okay. So Thank that's you. what we can do. I'm going to move now and talk about some other initiatives. I have three substance abuse providers here. Uh, and so I'm going to begin with Michael, but what I want to talk about specifically is uh, medically assisted treatment because uh, 
that has become somewhat of the standard for treating people with opioid use disorder. But I want to ask the more Michael, you, you guys at Operation Power are primarily a, a methadone, right? right? So talk about methadone and talk about what are some of the pushback and what are some of the misunderstandings maybe? Well, methadone, buprenorphine, and Vivitrol now are the three medications. And methadone, the research says, is the most effective treatment of opioid dependence. Um, Bradenton, our location, 6253 14th Street, our Bradenton MAPS program currently serves about 530 people diagnosed with this opioid dependence. And what I want to say is that 85% of those people are doing very well. They, mm -hmm. You would talk to them, you wouldn't know they were on any kind of medication when taken properly. There's no adverse effects on the body, mental capability, have jobs, and, and doing well. The other 15% are those that take up 85% of our time. So there's a lot of uh, serious issues. And someone had mentioned um, discharging people that actually meet the criteria for coming into the program. So we've, um, there's an organization called FATOD, F-A-T-O-D, Florida Association for the Treatment of Opioid Dependence. And there's 23 providers in the state of Florida, and they got together um, and they talked about what we're doing with discharging people. And discharging people who are more than likely going to go back to use intravenous heroin doesn't seem like a good alternative to what we're doing. So there's been a kind of shift in the thinking that we can, uh, you know, lower the dose, that we can keep these people in treatment. Um, the Narcan that was mentioned, which is the opioid overdose reversal tool, we are giving that to every patient that comes into our services. Mm -hmm. We know that people that have to take a big step to come into treatment, um, we provide them with that kit. We know that sometimes these people are still using, or no people that are still using, so they, you know, they're given education on how to use it, what to do. If they were to come back and ask for another kit, we just ask what happened with that first one, what was the experience or the outcome. We've had people saved at a bus stop because of us having the Narcan kits and able to um, help people. In addiction, what I've seen uh, in my 10 years is that there's an overarching issue of poverty. These people are taking a pretty big step to come into treatment, and there is uh, legal issues and criminal <clears throat> past that make it hard for them to get a job. There is limited housing resources available to them. Um, there's a lot of mental health, medical. Um, what we're doing is trying to connect these people to services so that they can succeed. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Samantha, I'm going to move to you. What, what initiatives does uh, Centerstone have to combat the opioid use disorder? <clears throat> so probably of what you heard a lot today is treatments kind of had to change with this um, disorder, the, uh, the opioid disorder. So about three years ago, we started trying to change the way we looked at it and how we treated these folks. So expecting them to show up at an office wasn't always happening, more likely not happening. So um, two programs I can think of that we changed or added to meet their needs is one's called FIT. It stands for Family Intensive Treatment Team. And that team um, works directly with folks involved in the child welfare system for an identified substance use disorder. Those folks, when they get into the child welfare system, oftentimes don't have the resources to get to treatment, to stay in treatment, and to complete the case plan they're given. Um, and so the FIT team's primary goal is to re reduce the barriers to treatment, whatever that looks like. Um, so they're community-based, so they go to the person in their natural environment. It's a team approach of a case manager, a therapist, and a certified uh, peer specialist. Um, they also are responsible for, for providing the mental health, substance um, use disorder treatment, and parenting, which is oftentimes the three main components of a case plan. Um, folks can stay in the program two years. You know, um, if they disengage, we keep them. Um, in the past, with outpatient, if someone disengaged, after 30 days, you close them. So um, it's a much different model um, designed to treat those folks differently, and it's working. It is um, seeing better success than just traditional outpatient. 
The second program that we work with the county on is called outpatient detox. So um, opioid withdrawal is very uncomfortable. And um, while folks may be able to get through the initial withdrawal, there also is the craving aspect mm -hmm. to opiates. And so if you can't provide almost immediate services to these folks, they're back out and using in a couple hours. And so um, we had a flood of people wanting inpatient detox for opioids. Um, we have 17 beds for detox. <laughs> so could not meet the demands of our community with that. So we developed an outpatient detox program that um, oftentimes can serve that person quicker than if they're waiting for a bed. So it's immediate medical interventions with a psychiatrist, um, group therapy, and individual wow. therapy okay, that good. day. Um, and so the chances of them returning the next day are much higher if they're feeling almost the immediate relief and hope that they can do this and they're starting to feel better. Um, and that program can be up to two weeks. Um, and we do provide transportation because again, expecting people to show up when they have very limited resources is unrealistic with this population. Okay, thank you. PJ, could you talk a little bit about uh, what First Step is doing? And I'd really like to talk a little bit about the uh, opioid program that you have in the drug court in Sarasota. Sure. Um, we actually, the, um, the opiate program that we have with the, with the drug court, within drug court, the track is actually an extension of the substance overdose uh, services uh, program that we were okay. that started in Sarasota County. Um, and it was actually a project that was in response to Sheriff Knight meeting with the Gulf Coast Community Foundation, just out of concern of the number of folks that are being co coming into the e emergency department, coming back out on the street and this revolving door of, of individuals, and hopefully they're going to survive on to the next, next uh, an issue. And so um, what we were able to do was develop a program that provides a care coordinator, case manager, um, along with a recovery peer specialist. We have two teams that work with those folks that are presenting at risk, whether it be through the emergency department or through our detox facility or pretty much anywhere that has opiates as one of their issues. Mm -hmm. Many times it's real clear, they're not purists. You know, we don't have individuals that just say opiates is my thing, you know, and yes, it may be, but depending on what else is available, yeah. um, many times they're also using benzos as well. I think that that is often the case. Yep. But so what they do is they wrap around the individual and engage with them to ensure that they connect to the resources that are available. They're often engaged with our, our MAT services. Well, along with that, uh, the sheriff is also uh, working on a diversion project, you know, looking at um, he's overcrowded in the jail and he's trying to lower those numbers, recognizing that the vast majority of those individuals in the jail are substance related. He has, um, I, I give, I'll tell you, I give credit to the law enforcement agencies in this community. You know, the, they, the, that they have lived by, we cannot arrest our way out of this problem. It's not rhetoric. It has been a stance that they have stood by and I, I, I think that's applaudable, you know, in many respects. But he. He has said, you know, we've got to do something to lower the numbers in the jail and get them the help they need. So we were able to create a track that fast tracks individuals out of the jail into drug court. And we've added that it's, ra it's included with the SOS team, but there's also a clinical practice. There's a clinical provider and a case manager as well mm -hmm. that works with 30 individuals as they're coming out. And the idea is to get them engaged as, uh, as rapidly as possible get them into the program, connect them to the resources that are available, and then work with them in that regard. Okay, thank you. Dr. Ben, I'm gonna to talk to you now. Uh, while you don't do treatment, you deal with the fallout. I call it the fallout. Um, the communicable diseases, uh, the other uh, things that happen. Could you talk a little bit about how the opioid uh, crisis has affect, affected the health department here in Manatee County for us, like things like hepatitis A, B, and C, I would imagine. Uh, HIV and, and any other issues that may come up. Yes, thank you so much for allowing uh, myself and my team to be here today. Uh, a lot going on in the world of public health related to this issue. So you said hepatitis A, B, and C. Um, a and B are preventable through vaccines. And uh, we want to first thank our partners here, including uh, the sheriff and, and the jail, because uh, with the hepatitis A situation in Florida and nationally, we are trying to get ahead of uh, the, the situation by focusing on those most at risk. And currently we're finding out that that is persons who are homeless and persons who use uh, drugs, particularly uh, IV. Okay. So we are in the jail 
almost daily uh, and also at many of our partner facilities. Um, we currently have 85 cases in Manatee County. We are considered in the top 10 in the state, although some of the other ones have hundreds of cases. Um, there are almost 2,000 cases in Florida. So we're really trying to push forward and do as much as we can to prevent this by giving vaccines mm -hmm. uh, to these individuals. Um, in terms of, uh, and just to emphasize also, um, hepatitis A is spread through a fecal oral route. So basically not washing your hands. So hygiene is extremely important. Uh, you mentioned the restaurants. We have had one restaurant worker in Manatee County who was positive, and uh, as a result, we did an initiative uh, to those patrons who were at that restaurant, and we were able to vaccinate over 400 people in two days during the 4th of July weekend wow. out at the beach uh, <laughs> where the restaurant was located. Um, but interestingly enough, no cases of transmission have occurred yet in Florida due to a restaurant worker. So um, we want everyone to be educated. Uh, the, the vaccine is available at the health department, at your providers. So please consider it. Also, especially if you're, you're traveling overseas, mm -hmm. uh, many countries are facing the same issues. Uh, so please get those vaccines as well. Uh, hepatitis B and C uh, transmitted a little bit differently, um, blood uh, and other um, fluids, bodily fluids. Uh, so um, we are also seeing a rise in, in both of those. Uh, hepatitis B, as I mentioned, uh, vaccine preventable. Uh, hepatitis C, uh, no. And as a result, it's very expensive and takes months to be treated uh, for it. So um, uh, something to, to consider from an economic standpoint in the community. Uh, same with HIV. Uh, so um, there is something called PrEP, and every health department in the state of Florida mm -hmm. now offers PrEP, right. and that is a, 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 pro, a prevention um, to not spread uh, HIV uh, through sexual contact if you are on this Truvada medication. Mm -hmm. So we're very excited that we have that as an option, but we don't want it to be uh, utilized um, and, and think there is no risk. Right. There's always risk. So um, making sure that's um, explained, and, and that's what we do through education as well. Two other items I want to mention um, in addition, okay. uh, endocarditis. So um, if uh, the blood uh, infection occurs in the body through IV drug use, it can affect the valves of the heart. It's a very expensive procedure at the hospitals to do this surgery, uh, and we're seeing obviously a, a large increase in those numbers as well. And, and also we can't forget the baby. So, um, substance exposed newborns. Thank you, I was gonna talk about that. Absolutely a, a, tra a tragedy because when, when moms are um, on drugs and deliver the child, the child has to go through withdrawal and stay in the NICU or the neonatal intensive care unit uh, for weeks to months. Um, and again, we don't even know the long-term effects yet. Right. What In 10, 20 years, what will be um, uh, the, the long-term results of, of having been through this type of, of, uh, of situation. Um, I, I'm proud to say um, in um, Manatee County, our health department uh, recently received a grant through the CDC. We were one of 14 counties in the country, and we're focusing on um, educating other hospitals about how well we're doing at Manatee Memorial Hospital, particularly with our alternatives to opioid program in the emergency room. We've also done a, a major campaign uh, to the community uh, about uh, prevention as it relates to drug use. Uh, we also are doing the evaluation of the peer-to-peer -peer program that was mentioned, and as you said earlier, educating our uh, medical community, our physicians, our dentists uh, who prescribe, that there is still a problem and we need to um, make sure that they're educating their patients and not offering them a tremendous amount of pills when only a few will do. Thank you. We have a little bit of time left, so I'm gonna move forward. I'm gonna give everybody about <clears throat> two minutes and I'm gonna time you, okay? So, <laughs> so you can, because we know where we are, but I like to say this, uh, I, I compare this to, to running in a track meet. Uh, if you're gonna w win the race, just because you see a finish line, you don't start easing up, you actually continue to push your way through. Because if you ease up, somebody's behind, you're gonna run right past you. And so, while we made great strides with the opioid uh, use disorder and the overdoses and those things, what are some of the things that are coming on the 
coming that, that are going to help us to continue to hold ground or even gain ground. And then I like to throw in, because time is short, methamphetamine is also on the rise in this area as well. So that being said, kind of tell me what are we doing to try to battle some of these. Uh, one I want to throw out is needle sharing programs. Are there any ideas about something such as a needle sharing program in Manatee County? <coughs> Josh, you know I'm talking. Um, <laughs> turned off. It's, on. it's back on. Okay. Um, that's a lot of questions. So I'm I just give it a needle share. How about this? this is not a short term issue. It is a long term strategy. We're dealing with the cognitive effects of children who have witnessed or experienced withdrawal or had parents who have had the trauma of overdosing in front of them. Uh, we have to deal with the long-term effects of long-term treatment in the environments in which these people live. So we need to continue to shift and challenge the substance use treatment to continue to monitor and address the contemporary issues of not just opioid use, but also substance use, keeping in mind that it is not isolated to one substance, it is more than one. And because of the benzos, there is a, there is a co-prevalence of depression or anxiety that goes along with this. We need to educate physicians and, and people who live here, how to have the conversation about having these multiple things that sort of result in having to take medications inappropriately or seek them. And with respect to syringe exchange, there is recent legislation that passed at a, an overwhelming rate in terms of any legislation um, that allows counties to make a determination of whether syringe exchange services can exist, which means you bring one in and you can leave with one. You do not leave with one unless you bring one in, and it provides opportunities for education to reduce the transmission of communicable disease, how to prevent yourself from having an um, accidental overdose, such as not using a loan. Um, so it's a critical point that allows people to go, and the reason it's important is it gets um, used needles off the streets. It has tremendous implications for reducing criminal justice involvement because if they're involved in the program, they can't be picked up for paraphernalia charges. It allows police officers to also have protection to help move people toward treatment, as is evidenced in Manatee County's efforts. But it also provides a gateway to people who are afraid to go to get treatment or to get resources because if you look at the pill mills and you look at the rate of getting a prescription, filling a prescription, and continuing to fill multiple prescriptions, there is an access issue, which means people have financial access to these things. We're not looking at the same thing now as pill mills, and I know you're two minutes, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, <laughs> but, we, but it is a gateway to people to preserve anonymity, to get the critical information, because if I go to my, my provider through my insurance to pay for that visit, something could show up, and that prevents people from accessing the services needed. So this is one more strategy to open up, open up the net to serve okay. people who are in need of treatment. I'm done. All right. Pass the mic along, Dr. What's, what's the health department looking at for the future? So public health is all about prevention and education. We need to get to our youngest population before they develop habits that mm -hmm. tend to be lifelong. It's harder to change us as adults. So we really want to focus on everything we can in, in uh, addressing issues, even vaping. Vaping is completely out of control and a, potentially a gateway drug for other things. So putting our emphasis on our children from all aspects, okay. nutrition, wellness, um, uh, anti-bullying, that self-esteem, teen pregnancy prevention, all of that needs to happen early so they can have healthy and happy outcomes in all life. Right. Thank you. Yeah, PJ? Um, I'm just going to reiterate, actually, th when we talk about getting to our kids, we, we need to be looking at whole behavioral health. We need to be recognizing the need to deal with both mental health and substance use issues concurrently. Um, what we're recognizing is, is that our adolescents oftentimes have mental health challenges, trauma experiences, whatever they may be, and they discover substances as a relief point. Um, it becomes bigger than feel good. And because of that, we need to be looking at it as a strategy as, as, we, as we consider ourselves. I'm very much an integrationist, meaning that we don't need to silo behavioral health over here, medical over here, schools over here. You know, we, we need to be looking at how we're bridging across systems and making sure that we have that continuity of care and we can, we can ensure that the kids get the support they need now so that we can hopefully mitigate those issues. I mean, the Surgeon General in 2016 came out with a report that one out of seven individuals are going to be dealing with the disease of addiction. One out of seven, okay? 
There's 325 million people in the U.S. If it was one out of 10, that's 32.5 million. So if, we're, if we can deal with it at that front end, we can mitigate a lot of what we're having to deal with on the back end. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Samantha? Um, I think the community has done a really good job over the last couple years of expanding services because everyone's recovery path is different and what works for one person is not necessarily going to work for another person. So making sure that we have programs that do fill the gaps of services we don't have and not just kind of adding to what we already have. Um, and also making sure that we fund substance abuse treatment and not necessarily a diagnosis because as PJ said earlier, oftentimes we're seeing people use many different substances or what was not a problem a couple years ago is now becoming a problem. And so having a variety of options for those folks, regardless of what they're using, is important. Captain Shear, anything you want to talk about the, moving forward with the Sheriff's Department that may be coming up? Sure, I've just- You've got a lot going on already. We've got a lot going on, Sheriff, don't we? Um, I'm just reminded of uh, what Ray Kroc, the uh, chairman of McDonald's said. He said, one of my favorite quotes, he said, uh, none of us are as good as all of us. And I think of just what we've done over the last three years as a community. We have gotten out of our own silo and we've worked together to uh, really see some fantastic results <clears throat> over the last three years. Um, by no means are we relaxed, are we uh, satisfied with the trend that we're seeing, um, mm -hmm. but we continue to uh, just work together. And I think that's the, the most important part is just mm -hmm. sharing uh, with one another with the common goal of getting folks help they need. And uh, I would just echo what they said, education and prevention is the, the key to the success here. Okay. Um, so my role for NEMS in and of itself is one innovation that we've taken because it's a role that can help with the mental health and substance use issues and help divert these people from going to the hospital and help connect everybody to the mm -hmm. you know levels of care that are appropriate. So on the individual levels for the people, I think that um, in EMS, we're gonna do a great job of helping people connect to the resources that they need. And then on like the other part is like, me and our program connecting to the resources and so that we all understand what everybody has to offer. And I think that personally what I can bring to the table is having come from a different community that has already done a lot of these types of initiatives. Um, I have some knowledge and understanding of how things I've seen work and not work in other places. So I'm excited to work on a new program and whatnot. Thank, Thank you. you. Michael, what about Operation PAR? Uh, we took uh, we took data in 2016 at all the moms that had babies that were on methadone. Um, there was over 300 births in 2016 for Operation PAR. 78% uh, of those babies were drug-free, meaning they only had the prescribed medication that they were uh, taking at the time of birth. The baby was mm. born that way. We also realized from that data that over 40% of those births were unplanned. So we've brought in Planned Parenthood to all of our programs to give information, to offer contraceptives, to work with our moms or all the um, patients that we have of childbearing <laughs> years. And we've also developed an endocarditis program where we move people out of the hospital after two weeks and bring them into our residential program and offer them the antibiotics while they're in there and give them treatment instead of sitting in a hospital bed, taking up money and time there. We've treated them. Thank you. Patricia? So our focus, or one of our focuses now, is to bring all of our people, we call them members, all of our members together to have recovery meetings. Judge. There is a model in the state to the Peer Coalition of Florida for recovery organizations that are run by peers, for peers, that offer all kinds of support and respite, okay. and that's what we're hoping to do. We find that we're in the field most of the time, so we see people one-on-one. -on -one. We want to bring them together so they can get the support from one another the same way they get the support from us. And that's our focus moving forward. I just wanted to say one thing to us because we just finished uh, sequential planning. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one of the things that came out of that is uh, collaboration, I think, is what we got to talk about. So one of the things I want to leave us with is how can all of the people in this room, providers, court system, law enforcement, how can we work more work together, whether it's sharing information, databases, whatever it may be, 
so that we can get a ahead of these problems as opposed to trying to run them down. I want to leave that with everybody, so we'll talk about that maybe the next time we get together. Okay, so I know we're running short on time and everybody is most likely hungry, um, but is there anyone with any particular questions? I look at Judge Hayworth because he always has. <laughs> so I am coming to you for the question of the day. I'm not allowed to get <laughs> So uh, I serve as a senior judge and I do dependencies. Those children that are born with neonatal abstinence syndrome addicted, they go to Judge D's, and as you know, we have a surge of those in Manatee County. So I come in occasionally trying to help with the termination of parental rights and the, and the dependency adjudications, that sort of thing. My question for you is this, two questions. First, physicians seem to be uh, routinely prescribing uh, Suboxone, uh, Subutex, Vivitrol. I don't see a lot of discrimination on that. I don't see a lot of methadone. But I do see a lot of those three. It's not like they're determining that this is the particular <coughs> good thing for that patient. It's their default. I don't know if that's been your experience. As a judge, what should we be looking for in trying to make sure the medication is appropriate for that patient? The second question is, we have parents that are coming in, taking those medications and testing positive as they should, but still appearing impaired. Can those medications be um, toxic at higher levels and what should we as judges or lawyers be looking at to make sure that they're doing it in the right way and they're not being impaired because of overdosing or taking more of whatever they're doing. Uh, they're not testing positive for the other bad stuff but for the prescribed meds and they're still looking to be impaired. Well, Anyone? I First, I think I like to say, I don't think Subutex is sold in, in America anymore. I think they stopped selling it in America. Suboxone should still be, uh, should be uh, done. But there are other alternatives now that I want to talk about, but time is, is moving. But they do have um, a subdermal buprenorphine implant called Bopifine. Uh, every six months, it's a subdermal. Uh, they also have Sublocade, which is a monthly injection. So those types of things, I think we might want to look at down the road too because there is abuse of some of these drugs, we understand that, but the more we move forward technologically and using some other alternatives, I think, because the drugs themselves serve a purpose, but if they're not utilized appropriately, then the purpose is lost. Josh, what do you think? <clears throat> so first of all, if someone is on a dose that appears to have behaviors that the dose may be too high, it's more just informing the case manager or the provider to say that there's some observable behaviors that need to be looked at. And that's important because the prescribing of medications such as Suboxone are in a titration. So they're trying to titrate them up to a effective dose. But unless those behaviors are observed to help inform what the effective dose is, they could be at a higher threshold. So I would say go back. And the other thing I would add in terms of the different variety of medications, not all medication will work for everybody. So someone who takes heart medication may be switching. It's the same for medication-assisted treatment. So you may start on one. It may be effective. It may not. You may have to transition to a different one. So I would just communicate with the prescriber as um, when possible if those are observed. Tricia? So I just want to add something that we call it medically assisted because there's a counseling aspect and there's an evaluation aspect. So a doctor can't prescribe without going through that process. So as Joshua said, one medication may work for one person and their lifestyle and their needs, another may work for somebody else. But it's not, it's not like... I, I look at these medicines similar to uh, diabetes meds and blood pressure meds. You have to take them but every day. And if you stop taking them, you're going to get sick. But there's also a aspect of personal responsibility. And we use that with the medically assisted by having counseling and requiring you to do the counseling. So you're talking to someone. You're not just being handed a pill. And then you don't see your doctor for three months. Or you get a six-month prescription. So that's the assisted part. And I think for I know that for us, when we send people to First Step in Sarasota, there's a whole evaluation process. It's, it's a long process. It's not a very simple thing to just go and get the med. Thank you so much. And I know I have one other question. One more? Jim, do you have a question? <coughs> thank, thank you, Judge, and thank you very much for organizing this. It's a 
both of y'all, I suppose, were involved in this. But thank you, and thank you to the community for all you've done. I worked, uh, of course, in the legislature the past couple of years on this issue with many of you, and I think we had good results as, as, a, as a collaboration from all of you. So thank you for the fight. The thing that concerns me, and I think the thing we missed in our last piece of legislation last year, and what I call the access and, and, um, and use bill, was the education that Dr. Bensey and, and Captain Shear talked about. And PJ, I remember when we were in Sarasota at the round table, and one of the guys from the uh, recovery uh, pod, I believe there, was saying kids coming out of elementary school, maybe even before they get to middle school, are not too young to start learning. So I know we can't answer this today, but I think that's a component that is critical for the community and anything we can do together to collaborate to get it into the education system perhaps or however we deliver that to kids. You all know better than I do what age is appropriate. I understand it's very young, but I really think we can't, shouldn't take our eye off that ball because that will have long-term effects. And from a, as a community person, I'd be happy to be part of that. I know many of my business colleagues would as well, but I think that's a critical component as we go forward in this fight. So thanks for doing this today and thanks for thinking about that. Thank you. Right, we probably have time for one more. Oops, I have all these rules. I can't go by a speaker. <laughs> I'm not supposed to give away the microphone. I failed on that epically. Go ahead. I won't hold it. My name is Julie Stahl, and I've been a drug court counselor here for seven years almost. And two things I'd like to share. It's because a lot of people in the court system may see the same people coming through all the time and may think that a lot of it's not working. Uh, one thing I would like to share is the recovery pod has made a huge difference with the clients that are coming into drug court. They have a huge head start on knowing what they want and how to achieve that because of what they've learned in the recovery pod, and it's been amazing. And also I'd like to share um, how important it is for people like Marjorie to um, the recovery um, coaches from Centerstone and the peer-to-peer -peer counselors from First Step are very crucial. Uh, we have evidence that it does work, recovery does work, and people like Marjorie show that. And we so often see the same people on the bad side, we don't see the, the positive side. And being here for as long as I have, a lot of clients do come back repeatedly and share how their lives have changed because of drug court and because of these programs, so it really does work. Thank you. Well. well I'm going to put in one plug. Okay. Am I alive? Oh, I am. You're alive. Um, because we have the sheriff with us today, uh, I oversee a specialty court by the name of Early Childhood Court, and it's a really special thing in our state. And I have so many parents um, that are just literally begging to get into the recovery pod. So you guys must be really full. Is there um, certain criteria that these folks have to meet? Are you guys just out of beds? Can you tell me a little bit more about how you can help parents who are really seeking to work for the benefit of their children um, by expanding the recovery pod? And then we're going to get out of here. But I'm going to put you on the spot. And give you the microphone. Real quick, it's, uh, it's beds. Uh, we, we started the program back three years ago with no additional funding, no additional staff. So uh, pr we had 30 beds at the time for uh, males and 30 for females. We've expanded that by 10, 40, 40. So it's really just about getting the funding to, I mean, I wish I could put 100 beds in there because I think that uh, we could do a lot of good. So uh, we continue to try to locate the funding. That's it. Okay, guys. Um, first of all, thank you so much to the panel. Which one should I do? <laughs> I appreciate you guys taking the time um, out of your days to come in and share this information. I personally have been learning so much over the past year. I've been traveling to Tallahassee and going to various conferences, both locally, uh, statewide, and nationally. And I'm understanding a lot more. And with the help of Alfred, um, over the past couple of months, I've learned an awful lot more. But it's important as um, members of the bar, people that are coming before the courts and trying to argue your points and try to help us understand, um, we need this knowledge. We went to law school. 
we didn't go to medical school. And it is really essential that the group comes together and really educates us. So we appreciate it. We appreciate everybody who's here today to listen and learn. And we appreciate you guys for helping us do that. So thank, thank you. And you thank much. you to Alfred. Thank you. I just want to say thank you once again to everybody who came out, taking time out of your day. And uh, maybe we'll do this again. Okay. Have a great day. All right. Thank you. <laughs>